first slide of another lecture, Silent But Deadly. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about silent inflammation. Inflammation. Let's have a look at that for a minute. Because to cut a long story short, the consensus of, of, of people who are really looking at this in, in an ethical way is that heart disease is triggered by inflammation. And it's the inflammation in the blood vessel wall which triggers, yes, of course, cholesterol will be there because it's there to try and help with the repair process. The macrophages are there because why would they be there? Inflammation. So what causes this silent inflammation? Why is it silent? Because it's inflammation that you don't feel. You're more aware of inflammation that occurs in your elbow or your knee, or you know when you have an inflammatory change, it's sore, right? But this is inflammation you don't feel. It can go on in the brain as well. And in fact, brain degeneration, we talk about Alzheimer's and dementia, is also very much linked to silent inflammation as well. So if we can tackle silent inflammation, guess what? We can tackle a whole series of different disease processes. I'll give you some clues how we can tackle it too. You don't mind if I do that here? All right. So, silent inflammation. What, what contributes to this? Smoking, diets that are high in sugar, fried foods and trans fats, inadequate exercise, stress, omega-3 deficiency, vitamin D deficiency, flavonoid and other phytonutrient deficiency. All of those things contribute significantly to this process called silent inflammation. And also, to add to that, these are other risk factors. Excess weight, existing heart condition, family history of heart disease, poorly controlled diabetes, long-term infection, or gum disease even. All these contribute to this silent inflammation that is going on in, in all of our system, not just in the heart. If you've got change, think of this for a minute. Have you ever thought of this? Or, uh, if you've got a process like atherosclerosis going on in the arteries in the heart, do you think you've got no change going elsewhere? Think about that for a minute. Do you think there is no inflammatory change going on anywhere else in your body? Doesn't make sense, does it? Why would it particularly select the heart? Why not your other blood vessels? Why not other tissues? If you have that process, you have a process. So if we talk about heart disease as a, an index of inflam inflammation, we're talking about a system, a body that's inflamed. You follow that reasoning? Yeah. Because the process is there. Inflammation markers, yes? So HCRP, high sensitive CRP, is a measure of inflammation, important in the context of vascular disease. Insulin, don't have time to talk about it, but insulin is also related to inflammation. The more inflammation you have in your body, the higher the insulin is, right? So all you need to know at this point is insulin is related, insulin related to inflammatory process. Uh, HbA1c is a measure of, 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 uh, of glucose regulation over the previous eight weeks. So it gives you an index of how well a person's been managing their glucose, their sugar, over the the previous two months. Fasting, tri triglycerides, cholesterol, we've mentioned. Vitamin D, somewhat you mentioned, and I'm gonna mention it a bit more in a minute. It's very important, not just for bone health, but for cardiovascular wellness. How many of you in this room know your vitamin D level? Put your hands up. Come, don't be shy, put your hands up. How many of you know your vitamin D level? You do, or not? I can't remember what it is, though. No. <laughs> All right. So, you see, now that's criminal. That's criminal. Do you know why? If I start, I could do a whole lecture on vitamin D. If I start to tell you what it does in terms of not only protecting bones, but regulating probably as many as 2,000 genes in our body, in regulating gene activity, Improving cardiovascular wellness, improving immune function, helping the immune system to be more modulated and controlled. The list goes on and on. There are seven times more published papers on vitamin D since 1990 than there ever was before. And the list of what it's doing in the body is it's not a vitamin, it's a hormone. Which other vitamin do we produce from sunlight on the skin? None. Now, you can get it in some foods, yes, you can get it. But 
70% of people that I'm testing in my own clinic are deficient in vitamin D. And if you think it's a problem with just the UK, I have a project in Sicily, and we did a trial on eight people, and six of them were vitamin D deficient. What are they, why, what business are they having vitamin D deficient when they're living in a warm country? I, when I was lecturing in Portugal recently, a nutritionist that I was speaking to, she said, I'm seeing the same thing. It's a global problem, folks. It's a global problem. And the point is, if people are walking around with vitamin D deficiency, then we're compromising many physiological things that are going on. You follow what I'm saying? But if we're not measuring it, and doctors aren't measuring it, how are we empowering people to better health? Because most of us here should be taking vitamin D. I take 5,000 units of vitamin D with vitamin K every day, just as a preventative. You might think that's a large dose. But the experts are saying people should be taking between two and 5,000 units a day to get all the benefits that vitamin D can give you. So, because it's important for cardiovascular health and other things, we have it in the panel. Now this one, SIP, is a silent inflammation profile. Do you know what that is? It measures the ratio of omega-3 to 6. Now, omega-3 to 6, most people in the West are omega-6 dominant. Yes? You know omega 3s from fish oils, yes? Fish. fish, yes? And flax seeds and hemp seeds, yes? Omega 6, it, the ratio is very important in determining your level of silent inflammation, which we've already said is an important process in what? Disease and heart disease in particular, right? So measuring the ratio of omega 3 to 6, or omega 6 to 3 actually, is, is actually a very important measure. How many of you here have had it done? That doesn't surprise me. Listen, if hardly any of you have had your vitamin D done, I'm pretty sure none of you would have had your SIP score measured. Here's the thing, it can be measured, doctors don't offer it. If you go and ask your doctor to measure your SIP score, he'll look at you blankly, as if you've just landed from Mars, right? Because it's not measured routinely, no one do doctors, most doctors don't know it's actually available to be measured, but it can be measured from a, even from a blood spot that you do from home. So, here's the thing. Most people, that, that ratio that I measure, the ratio is at least 10, 15 to 1. That means they've got 10 to 15 more times more omega-6 than omega-3. That means that, and this is all you need to know, omega-6, pro-inflammatory, means it favors inflammation. Omega-3, anti-inflammatory. So if you're walking around with a SIP score, which is very dominant to omega-6, what does that mean? It means that you have pro-inflammatory predisposition, yes? You can change that by just taking more omega-3s in the diet or supplementing with a good fish oil, IFOS program, five-star rated, preferably. Ask me later what that means, okay? Because I, I want to press on. Yeah, so, can be tested from home. So all of a sudden, we have, we're, we're, we're very soon, we're, this is available now, but very soon we'll have a, a heart uh, monitor, a heart uh, map that could be done from your own home. We have a test kit that can be done from your own home. And we have products which can help. We like that a lot, don't we? Because that's really about... See, for me, if I try and teach doctors, to, doctors are stuck. It's not that doctors are bad. People. Don't get me wrong. Most doctors I know are very well-meaning. But the problem is, is they've been... We're stuck in dogma. And not only are we stuck in dogma, we're stuck and constrained by the way we're told to practice. Yes. We must follow a script. Most have to follow a script, and if they don't, they can get into trouble for doing that. But the point is, and, and this is why I do talk to doctors and I challenge them, why do you accept the dogma that you've been taught at medical school? Everybody has a responsibility to educate and learn for themselves, and that's what I've done. Most of the stuff I practice now, I didn't get from medical school at all. I, I learned it for myself and learned from other doctors who broadened their horizons and, and taken off their blinkers. All right, lastly, natural solutions. I have to start with this because um, you have, this was, uh, this is across uh, different countries, in fact, across 20 countries. And you should know this, really. I mean, this is why I'm telling you so that you know is this is the rate of heart disease 
plotted against amount of animal protein in the diet. And what you see is almost a straight line correlation, which means that the more animal protein that you have in the diet is the more heart disease is present. Sorry about that, folks. But one of the, one of the first things to prevent heart disease is to reduce the amount of animal foods in the diet and increase the amount of plant-based foods. So it's what it is. You could change your risk of heart disease just by doing that by 50%. That's what the studies show. If you take the top quarter of intake of fruits and vegetables, for example, uh, is that what I want to say? What was I saying? Heart disease, that's right. Sorry. If you, that's, that is what I want to say. If, if you take the top quarter of intake of fruit and vegetable intakes across different populations and compare against the bottom quarter in terms of volume of intake, there's a 50% difference in risk of heart disease and cancer. So, simple message. The five-a-day message is, is actually, it sounds very simple, but do you know that less than 10% of European population, the UK, are eating five portions of fruit and vegetables a day? And who do you think that's a disservice to? Only ourselves. Because the reality is, is that in, and I'll show you, how do fruits and vegetables actually reduce risk? And the theory goes that actually they're rich in antioxidants, which you'll mostly be familiar with. Antioxidants, phytonutrients, plant-based substances, which actually mop up these free radicals, which are highly reactive chemicals, which can damage cells, including the endothelial lining of the arteries. Yes, but they damage other cells too. In, and not only the cells, but they damage the cell membrane, they damage the mitochondria and the DNA within the nucleus. There is no part of the cell that cannot be damaged by these excess free radicals. Theory goes, these antioxidants in present in fruits and vegetables in huge amounts mop up the excess free radicals and stop them damaging the cell. That's the theory. It happens to be only a very small part of the truth. Because the truth is this is that if you look at fruits and vegetables, and we'll come on, don't worry, we're coming on to some other stuff in a minute. If you look at fruits and vegetables, they, con they contain a, a families of different compounds. For example, carotenoids, which are the bright colors, there happens to be about 600 of those that have been identified in nature. And what about the flavonoids, which are also the dark colors, the dark pigmented berries, anthocyanins, and anthocyanidins, they flavonoids, also the flavor. There are 7,000 of those that have been identified in nature. And what about the isoflavones, the phytoestrogens, and the isothiocyanates from cruciferous vegetables, the broccoli, kale, cabbage, cauliflower, etc. Organosulfur compounds, which are from uh, onions and garlic, monoterpenes, terpenoids, citrus fruits, resveratrols you'll know about, not from red wine, but from the grape, of course. Yes, Every time I ask that question, I say, where do you get resveratrol? People say red wine. No, it, how did it get there? It gets there from the grape skins, right? And the thing is, um, and also also found in chocolate as well, actually. So salvestrols, you may not have heard of, unique family of compounds, potently anti-cancer. Don't have time to tell you about it. But melatonin also is a hormone released from the pineal gland at the base of the brain. What is a pineal hormone doing in fruits and vegetables? Mm. You don't want to get me on that one. That was, that's another talk. Okay. What is it doing there? But it's there. It is there. Now, here's, here's the point I wanted you to get. If you look at all, though, these three families, and I, this was from the previous slide, but just pick out those three, and this is a summary of what the science has published on those compounds. First of all, yes, we know they're antioxidant. They are. They decrease DNA damage. They improve cell communication. They improve cell detoxification. They are anti-inflammatory, folks. They boost immunity. They improve circulation. Forget that, I, because I don't have time to explain what it is. But here's the thing. They are critically involved in regulating our gene expression. Yes, you heard me right. That's what the studies show, is that actually, just like I said for vitamin D, these, these phytonutrients in plant foods actually help to regulate our gene behavior. What is that all about? I'll tell you what it's about. Design. That's what it's about. It's this <coughs> nutrigenomics, the ability of key nutrients to be able to influence the way that our cells behave right down to the genetic level. 
which determines cell function anyway. Vitamin D, I already told you a bit about it, but several studies providing evidence that it has a protective effect on the heart. In the Framingham Heart Study, patients with low vitamin D concentrations, i.e. less than 15, I see that not, not uncommonly. Less than 15 had 60% higher risk of heart disease than those with higher concentrations. In the health professionals follow-up study, found that subjects with low vitamin D, less than 15 again, were two times more likely to have a heart attack than those with high concentrations. You see, vitamin D is also important to the heart. And another study which followed men and women for four years, patients with low vitamin D, less than 15 again, were three times more likely to be diagnosed with high blood pressure than those with high concentrations. Oh. So you see, in the context of cardiovascular health, this is an important, this is an important compound. And most of you don't know what yours is. You have to change that. Observational studies have shown a relationship between low vitamin D and blood pressure, coronary artery calcification, and existing cardiovascular disease. We can say it over and over and over again, but the facts remain the same. It improves vascular, this is vitamin D, improves vascular muscle function, it controls blood pressure, improves glucose tolerance as well. And it is anti-inflammatory, just like those phytonutrients. So you see, if we get enough vitamin D and we get enough plant foods, um, and we get enough omega-3s, all of a sudden we're changing our inflammatory risk from several angles. And we're not doing it, you know why? Because I'm measuring it in people and we have pro-inflammatory, we don't have enough vitamin D, and we don't need enough plant foods. So we are sitting ducks for disease, silent inflammation, heart disease, and other diseases, and that's why we are. And until we change our nutritional profiles, and we assess these things in people, until we empower people to be monitoring these and tell them how they can change them, we are not going to change risk, because we're changing the wrong things. Trying to drive cholesterol down is doing nothing but pe make people sick. And they said this before, yes, see, here's, I'm just showing you, sunlight, dehydrocholesterol. I didn't lie to you. It's cholesterol, which is the precursor for vitamin D. You need cholesterol. You need it. If it's raised, it means you're repairing something or you're making more hormones. One other thing on cholesterol. You commonly see, when do you tend to see raised cholesterol in people? It's as you get older, right? Yeah? It's as you get older. But guess what happens as you get older? Your hormones deplete. So could it be that, and if you've got vitamin D deficiency as well, it, could it be that actually your body is putting out more cholesterol to try and help you with those processes? I say the answer is yes, you know how I know that. Because if you give people hormonal restoration, bioidentical hormones I use in my practice, those are natural hormones made from plants, so not synthetic estrogens or synthetic progesterones. If you restore hormones, guess what happens to the cholesterol? Same compound, that nutritional formula that we used for 14 weeks in people who had two diagnoses, which were high blood pressure and diabetes type two. We found that 12% of the patients were able to discontinue all conventional medicines. 15% were able to discontinue two. 23% were able to discontinue one of their medications, and 40% of the rest were able to reduce doses in their medications. This is a nutritional formula, which, which I showed you the pictures before and after with the heart, but actually, of course, it's affecting cells in general. It was affecting the diabetes control, it was affecting their ability to control their blood pressure. Fundamental cell nutrients. And I can't tell you, what's, I can't tell you what is in that particular formula, but, it will be available soon. This you know about, you heard it this morning, 1998, nitric oxide, we need to talk about it very briefly, I won't say too much in closing because you've already heard quite a lot about it already. But the point is, it was a significant discovery because it's a very important signaling molecule in the body and in particular in the cardiovascular system. It controls whether the vessels are constricted or dilated. It controls blood flow. It's one of the key mechanisms by which we control blood flow. And these are the three doctors that got the Nobel Prize for that discovery in 1998. You heard that earlier. And it's produced in, in, uh, from arginine, as you've probably heard. You heard that too. 
uh, produce nitric oxide released from the endothelium, which is the inner layer. Here it is, the inner layer of the, of the blood vessel. That's where the nitric oxide is produced. Just briefly, uh, it, was, it does come from L-arginine. In rabbits that were made atherosclerotic by feeding them cholesterol, uh, it stopped the progression. Nitric oxide was able to stop, the pro or rather L-arginine, by nitric oxide production was able to stop the progression of arteriosclerosis. L-arginine is the only amino acid with this specific function, i.e. to release nitric oxide. And also, we found that people who are at risk of stroke and uh, uh, heart disease tend to lack nitric oxide. And there are particularly people who should be given supplemental L-arginine. Humans with atherosclerosis, diabetes, or high blood pressure often show impaired nitric oxide pathways, you see? So atherosclerosis, diabetes, and high blood pressure, there tends to be impaired nitric oxide production, which is why you're being told about this product. So this is one of the important tools, natural tools, that we can wield to change risk. That's what it's about. So in closing, any substance, the MHRA, which is the Medicines, Healthcare, and Regulations Authority, equivalent to the FDA in the States, says this. It says that a medicine, actually this is the definition of a medicine, any substance or combination of substances presented for treating or preventing disease in human beings or animals, any substance that is reported to do that, or any substance with a view to making a diagnosis or to restoring, correcting, or modifying physiological function. Well, that, if we hold to that, 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 that uh, definition, sorry, what does that make phytonutrients, omega-3, vitamin D, and L-arginine? But you can't say that. You see, the, you see the problem? You see, by that definition, we, there's no question that certain key nutrients have medicinal, have medicinal effects. By that de definition, they are medicine. But we cannot say they are medicines. <coughs> By law. So we can't sell them as medicines. But this is about, what I'm about, is empowering people to the knowledge that these things can have medicinal benefit. Yeah, because a lot of people fear moving away from their doctor's advice. My parents, I'll tell you frankly, my, my parents, unbeknown to me, put on statins, I went mad, I went mad, took them off straight away. Both of them improved significantly within two weeks of coming off the statin. Now I'm not saying anything that I don't do myself, yes? I'm just empowering you with that knowledge. So this is where we started, and look folks, if we're waiting to get this information from our, our doctors, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's the reality. In summary, we are not winning the war against heart disease. We're detecting it too late for a start. The insufficient preventative measures, incorrect preventative measures, because I'm referring to particularly trying to drive cholesterol down into our boots. Uh, Non-invasive, I talked to you about some techniques that you can use. Non-invasive, early, earlier detection measures, uh, which are going to be available even in your own home, and some of them already are. Non-invasive natural solutions, we talked about phytonutrients, we talked about omega-3, we talked a little bit about L-arginine, and we talked about vitamin D. All of these things are the way to empower us to better cardiovascular wellness in the future. I have no hesitation in making that statement. I share it with you happily, gladly. Take this information, embrace it, make it empower your own lives. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.